Because on one side of the coin, I felt like I could never be good enough. They were hard enough on me that I never did feel like I was good enough. But on the other side of the coin, I would also often get told that I was I was too good and that I was self-righteous. One of the most frustrating myths that members believe about people who leave the church is that they never had a testimony. And I think even the most dishonest of, of people that know me could not deny that they knew that I had a strong testimony. I was, if anything, obnoxious about it. I had completely lost the ability to make money and to prosper. Like I could not fathom in my mind how I could prosper anymore because I didn't even know who I was. I didn't have family anymore. I was all alone. When you're an active member of the church, these terrible things that happen to you are trials, trials of your faith. But if you're out of the church, these bad things that happen to you are because you're not living righteously and God can't bless you. And it's so unfair to the people who leave because I'm going through probably something I would have gone through anyways had I stayed with the church. This is going to sound crazy to believing members that may watch this. I left the church at the end of the day because I Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 29 of the Clarity Podcast. I'm your host, Claire, and this week's guest was Dallin Lyman. We're all familiar with Carly from Carly Searches and Praise, and today we brought on Dallin, her husband, to share with us all about his journey of how he left the church to follow Jesus Christ, and his story is not only unique, but it's beautiful, and it took crazy faith to go through all that he went through to get to the place that he is now. Stay tuned for all this and more on this week's episode of the Clarity Podcast. Everyone has a journey they're walking, and along that road, we are met with potholes, road bumps, rain, storms, and sometimes just fog. But through it all, we're really just looking for one thing, clarity. Clarity so we can walk with confidence in that next step. There's one source I run to for that clarity. In the darkest of nights, Jesus offers me light that shines through even the thickest storms. Welcome to the Clarity Podcast where we find clarity through the one who saves us all. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 29 of the Clarity Podcast. I'm your host, Claire, and this week's guest is Dallin Lyman. You guys are all familiar with Carly Lyman from Carly Searches and Praise, and we had Carly on here not too long ago, and so now we're bringing her husband on to share his perspective of his story, and we're ex so excited to hear his perspectives. Welcome to the podcast, Dallin. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so excited to hear your story. So let's jump right into the questions. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, how old you are, and where you're from. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm 30 years old. I'm about to turn 31. Uh, I was born in in Salt Lake. Uh, spent most of my life living in and around Utah. I lived in Washington, Idaho, and Wyoming a little bit growing up, and uh, <clears throat> that's that's kind of where I grew up. Uh, we most recently have moved out to Tennessee and, and that's where, uh, myself, Carly and our three kids are living now. That's awesome. Okay. Let's jump into your childhood. Tell us a little bit about you as a kid and what part religion played in kind of your background to give our audience a little bit of context for your religious background. Yeah, absolutely. So the church played a really big role in my upbringing. Uh, when I was born, my dad was a ex Mormon slash atheist. He he didn't believe in the church. He had been raised in it, but had pr turned pretty sour against it. My mom was raised with with LDS family members, but because of her dad, she was raised uh, really really anti as well, really against the church. And uh, when I was <clears throat> younger, when I was uh, about three four years old. My aunt, my dad's sister, used to take me to to the LDS church uh, many Sundays, um, uh, almost every Sunday. And I remember, well, I don't remember this, but my mom tells me that when I was <clears throat> three years old, I came home from church one day and told her that I was going to go on a mission. And I was super excited to go on a mission. And she kind of freaked out about that and uh, stopped letting me go for a while. But I remember during that time uh, growing up, that my mom uh, was really searching and trying to find a church uh, that she could raise us in. She didn't really know what she believed, but she knew she believed in God and, and really believed that it was important to raise us with uh, uh, 
foundation of faith in some regard. <clears throat> and so I remember as a kid growing up, uh, going to several different churches, trying out different things. I remember the coolest ones were the ones who let us watch veggie, veggie tales and eat donuts, you know? <laughs> um, but that was a, uh, you know, kind of what happened until later on, uh, one of my dad's friends started coming over a lot more and sharing his testimony of the church. And that ended up leading to my mom getting baptized into the church. And uh, my dad ended up uh, coming back as well. Uh, so my mom got baptized when I was six. <clears throat> uh, I ended up going through the temple with my family and getting sealed when I was seven. And then I got baptized when I was eight. Yeah, that happened so quick for you from, you know, your family was super not not LDS. And then, you know, six, seven, eight, all of a sudden they're LDS and you're jumping in and ready to be baptized. What was that like for you as a kid? And did it feel overwhelming at times or did it feel kind of fast? What were your feelings at this time in your life? So at this time, uh, I, I had grown up in, in not a super unstable home, but definitely uh, there wasn't a whole lot of stability in our home. And during this period of time, I felt like there was some unification going on in, in the family. I felt like that uniting on, you know, preparing to go to the temple and going to the temple and all the things that my family did around the time, I feel like it kind of united my family and brought my, my parents closer together for a time. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't really feel overwhelming. If anything, it felt like, like things were finally starting to, to work out. And, uh, and, you know, my baptism in particular, <clears throat> I remember being a very, uh, very special spiritual experience. And I remember having a very moving experience. I remember when I got baptized, feeling really devoted to following Jesus Christ. And, uh, and I definitely remember feeling different after the baptism. Uh, however, one thing that I've often thought about is that at the time I didn't really have sin to lay down. But yes, it, it was a, a very special time in my life. Yeah, definitely. I definitely relate to that in that it's hard for me to just throw away my baptism like it didn't matter because I think it did matter. And so yeah. those of us in this place, you kind of think about those things. But I, I think for me, it mattered. And I think for lots of others, it, it matters. So that's really cool that you had that experience. Let's go ahead and transition into your teenage years and tell us a little bit about what your life was like in the church when you were a young man. This is a pivotal time in your life. Um, you're learning and growing. Tell us what your life was like at this time. Yeah, so <clears throat> the church played a, a really instrumental role throughout my teenage years and, and just kind of helping me to be grounded because I grew up in a really conflicting home. Um, I had, I had loving parents, uh, but they had been raised by, uh, by really strict parents, both of them. And so they were also very, very strict and very hard on us. They held me to a really high level of expectation. They expected a lot out of me. They wanted me to be as close to perfect as I could be. And it was interesting because on one side of the coin, I felt like I could never be good enough. And I was often, you know, they were hard enough on me that I never did feel like I was good enough. But on the other side of the coin, I would also often uh, get told that I was I was too good and that I was self-righteous and that I was, you know, too into the church, you know, and that it was going to my head and all these things. I remember <clears throat> one time in particular when I was getting ready to go on my mission, my uh, my dad myself and my brother went to the, the priesthood session for conference one year. And uh, when we had gone to the priesthood session, I remember having a really spiritual experience, feeling really moved upon by the spirit. And afterwards, it was our tradition to go out to eat. And I remember <clears throat> my dad wanted uh, to go out to this wing place. that was kind of like a sports bar. Uh, it felt very much like a bar that kids were somehow able to go to. Uh, more than just like a family restaurant that had a bar just for context. Mm -hmm. And we loved the wings there. We always would go there. We had a lot of fun. But this particular day, I was like, you know, Dad, I'm really feeling the spirit. This was a really special experience for me. And I would really rather go somewhere more mellow. You know, could we go to a diner or something like that? <clears throat> and I remember my dad just shaming me and telling me how, uh, how self-righteous I was, how, how I way overthought things. I was too serious. And, uh, and that really, that really scarred me. It really stuck with me because I was trying to be good. I was trying to live up to his expectations, but it felt like the more I sought to live up to his expectations, the, 
the more resistance I got from him. And so because of all of this, uh, the church really played a, a, a role in, in giving me somewhere to go, giving me a support system that I could count on, that I could lean on, and that I could trust. It gave me some consistency in my life. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of really latched onto it. Uh, I, I went all in with everything that I had. And, uh, you know, there were periods of time when, you know, most of my growing up years, my parents were were active in the church. But even at times where they would go through inactive spells, I would usually find a ride to church. I would go on my own. I would do whatever I had to do to be there because that's where I felt welcome. And that's where I felt uh, I had a purpose and a community and, and a future. And uh, <clears throat> so another thing that I did when I was in high school is I was homeschooled then. And I had a lot of time on my hands. And so I was actually going to double seminary. Uh, we were on like an A-B schedule. And so we would have like the, the A classes would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then the B classes would be Tuesday, Thursday. And it would switch every week. And uh, because I just couldn't get enough of, of the scriptures and church and everything, I was going to double, double seminary. And I was going to the, uh, the same class for both. And uh, just kind of double dipping and, and really growing that, uh, that testimony deeper. Another thing that I did, you know, in preparation for my mission, because ever since I was about 16, I was really serious about going on a mission. So because of this, to prepare, I was reading a minimum of five pages out of the Book of Mormon every day, as well as reading two pages out of Preach My Gospel and writing in my journal every single day. I remember I was really disciplined with this for about three years because I really, really wanted to go out. I wanted to be prepared to go out on my mission. And so the church, in in a very large sense, gave me uh, something to hold on to at that time. Yeah. You know, I really love this topic of conversation that you bring up, too, about how, you know, your dad would tell you that you were self-righteous. And I think this is something that we see in the church a lot or in our communities or families where, you know, there's a big theme of we don't judge people. But what that translates to is that we don't judge people who are deeply steeped in sin and they don't want to come out of it. But those of us who are trying so, so hard to repent and to do our best, we often get harshly judged. And so it's a little bit of an irony there. And and so it was kind of cool that you got to see some refuge within the church there because I did not have refuge in my journey. <laughs> that The church was not my refuge. My home was my refuge for, you know, those areas of my life. So kind of kind of unique and kind of cool your your perspective there. So, let's go ahead and transition into your into your mission. Tell me a little bit about what your mission was like and tell us where you went on a mission. Yeah, so I served my mission in the Micronesia Guam mission on a little island called Pompeii. I I spoke Pompeian. I had to learn it when I was there. I didn't get taught it in the MTC. There were just there were too many languages uh in the mission, and there were uh, all of the languages were too rare for them to be effectively taught in the MTC. So I had to learn the entire language and everything once I got there. My mission was amazing. I had a wonderful experience. That's that's one area where Carly and I really differ is that she had a traumatic, almost testimony shattering experience on her mission, and my mm-hmm. mission was was. You know, at the time, I didn't think so. But looking back, it was it was a picture perfect mission. Really, there was a lot of rocky points. There's a lot of ups and downs, but it all evened out to just being an overall incredible experience. Uh, I was blessed to to baptize a a very large number of people uh, and to have really unique, really special experiences on my mission. I have a lot of people ask me, you know, now that I've left the church, if I regret serving a mission. And if I'm being completely honest, I don't regret serving a mission. I think that it was one of the most special experiences of my life that made me who I am today. The only thing I would change is my focus. I wish I would have been more focused on genuinely helping people deepen their relationship with Jesus Christ than trying to get them baptized and move through the process and move through the lessons and and trying to squeeze them into the church's mold, you know, of all these things that you have to do perfectly and you have to you have to do this and you can't do that. And 
I wish I would have just known then what I know now about Jesus Christ and help them to deepen their relationship with the Jesus I now know. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Do you feel like your mission kind of shaped you and molded you into the man that you've become or the man that you became after your mission? Yeah, I definitely think so. You know, it, it taught me a lot about trusting in God about listening to his spirit. You know, there's so many times when I felt like I was at a dead end road. I felt like I had a challenge way too big for me. I mean, even just learning this language that I had to learn, I got transferred away from my trainer into a brand new area that had never been worked, tasked with starting a new branch out of scratch uh, with no members that I knew uh, for sure lived there definitely none that were active. That was only three transfers after getting there. So I had only had four and a half months to learn bits and pieces of the language. Then I was just thrown in the fire with a brand new missionary who didn't speak a word. And I had to teach him the language and uh, accomplish all these other tasks. I look back on that experience. I thought that my mission president was crazy when he did that. When he made that call, when he sent me there, I was like, I may have over exaggerated how well I'm doing with the language in my emails with you. I don't really know what you're thinking. What part have I played in making you think this is a good idea? But I look back and it taught me a lot about trusting, trusting in God. And it taught me a lot about experiencing the real power of God beyond myself. That's something that is completely impossible for me to accomplish is 100% possible with God. And that, that, really deeply seated within me, uh, the, the faith that I now have in him. That's really beautiful. I love that. I love hearing mission stories that changed these people's lives into the person they are today. And it's just a beautiful story. I think we're seeing that less and less with the missionaries that are coming home now and going out now. And so I think it's beautiful that you were able to experience that. So let's go ahead and transition into your young adult years now. So you've come home off the mission. Um, you were really shaped and molded on the mission. Tell us a little bit about what the church looked like in your life and a little bit about meeting Carly and singles wards, things like that. I remember that last transfer of my mission. That's when your mission president starts talking to you about, okay, what are you, what are you going to do when you get home? And starts kind of telling you, okay, now's the time to don't get, don't get too antsy to go home. You still have work to do, but you need to start thinking about like, what's your plan? Are you going to go to school? Are you going to work? Are you going to try and get married right away? How soon are you going to do that? And I remember my mission president, I had a new mission president, my last transfer. And I remember he focused a lot on the importance of getting married, finding my eternal companion as soon as I got home. That that was my new mission. Uh, he kind of helped me to, to, to think of it rather than I'm going home from a mission, I'm being transferred back home for a new assignment in my mission. And it was a really cool way of, of looking at it. And I took that to heart. I was, uh, as soon as I got home, I mean, I think I went on my first solo date, either the first day or second day after getting home. I hadn't driven a car on a highway in two years. And here I am driving this poor girl to mini golf. And uh, I just, I got busy right away. I started dating like crazy, going to three, four some, uh, institute classes at a time. And I was, I was there for the, for, for Jesus, but I was also there because I knew that, that these classes would definitely have some babes, you know, and uh <laughs> I was very strategic as to what classes that I chose and everything. And uh, I remember, man, I was I was probably dating a minimum of two and upwards of six dates a week, uh, most mostly with different girls. It was it was just like the mission. I was out prospecting in the day. You know, I'd, I'd you know, hang out at Institute. I would go to the school campus and I would meet all these girls and get their phone numbers and take them on dates. And I got it to be a really refined system. By the time <clears throat> I finally met Carly, I had kind of chilled out a little bit. I had, uh, you know, just been going too. I was, I was too invested in trying to just find my spouse as soon as possible. I finally pumped the brakes and that's when I met her. I finally enrolled in school at UVU and uh, got my own, you know, apartment and everything there. And I ended up meeting her in the singles ward that our apartment complex shared. And then from then on, you know, I met her. We weren't really into each other at first, uh, but that kind of changed and grew over time. And before we knew it, we were married with kids. 
That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I love how once you put the brakes on, that's when the right person came along. <laughs> it, it is ironic. I've noticed a pattern of that in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you could go on that many dates in one week. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> It, it was exhausting, but it was also kind of what I was living for at the time. So, <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is. I had been doing the same thing just a year before on my mission. So really, I just I literally just plugged and played the same model into return mission life. <laughs> Instead of investigators, I was looking for for a bride. Well, all right. Who knew that you could do that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Pretty now that fun. I understand what the young men were thinking when I was in the singles ward. Wow. <laughs> oh, yes. Probably a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, for real. Okay. All right. Tell us a little bit about what your relationship with Jesus was like at this time where um, you were getting married and starting your family and what chart and what part the church played as well during this time. To be honest with you, I, from a very young age, I'm talking since I was about eight to nine, somewhere in there. Uh, I've had a very strong, a very strong relationship with, with my savior, with our savior. And, uh, and that of course just continued to grow as I grew up. And as I went on my mission, as I came home, um, I had a very strong relationship with Jesus Christ and, uh, I, I was doing everything that I, I thought I should, you know, once Carly and I had gotten married, you know, I was very, very serious about being a righteous priesthood holder. I wanted to to lead the family. I wanted to, to, to be that spiritual leader. And I really wanted to raise my kids to be that as well, especially our first two kids who were boys. I wanted them to, to see what a righteous priesthood holder looked like. And I wanted my daughter to, to see the type of man uh, that she, that I hoped she would marry. Uh, all of our kids uh, were blessed uh, in the church, you know, when they were babies, uh, we were at church uh, nearly every Sunday unless we were sick. Even when we were traveling, I remember we would always plan our trip around uh, making sure we're in a town that has a church building at the time that sacrament meeting was supposed to happen. And uh, we would at least go to sacrament meeting. You know, we were very devoted. We were very, very serious about the church. And we had very strong testimonies in the church around this time. Yeah, definitely. I really love your story because it's so similar to, you know, everyone else that we bring on this podcast where we're talking about faithful, faithful members of the church who are kind of waking up to the things around them and realizing that the good that we were trying to do in the church isn't any more in alignment with the church. And so I think it's really cool that you, you were such a faithful member and like, you can see that in your heart and in your story. Yeah. You know, I, I really, I think that one of the most frustrating myths that members believe about people who leave the church is that they never had a testimony. Mm -hmm. And I think even the most dishonest of, of people that know me could not deny that they knew that I had a strong testimony. I was, if anything, obnoxious about it. You know, I, <laughs> I had like all of my my friends who like cared about me and and we were bros, but we wouldn't hang out a lot because they just felt like I was a little too churchy. And you know what I mean? It was always mm -hmm. a theme. If anything, I was always considered to be a little too serious about the gospel. That accusation that many members make against people who leave definitely, definitely did not apply to to me. <laughs> no, I get it. Totally. Okay. So let's start talking about kind of your awakening journey a little bit. Sure. What was the first step to waking up and coming out of the church? Yeah. So keep in mind up to this point that I never in a million years would have ever even dreamt that the church was anything less than the one true church of God. You know, that the church that Jesus Christ restored, or sorry, that Jesus Christ had, had established when he was on the earth that Joseph Smith restored. I mean, the whole thing. I mean, I... I had that Kool-Aid on an IV drip just running through my veins. I believed it with all of my heart. I had so much confidence. There, there were a lot of things that the church offered me, but in, in a world that seemed to be drifting further and further away from God and in a world where, you know, uh, obviously it's, we're in the end of times and, and things started to get ugly years ago. Um, but I always knew that or always believed at least that the church would be a refuge from all of that, that they would resist the evil, that they would stand, that they'd be the light on the hill, 
you know, the safe haven. Things started to, to shift a little bit in 2020. What really shook us, you know, obviously 2020 started off, it was weird from like January 1st on. I think we can all remember there was like the broomstick challenge and, you know, <laughs> and the the Kobe Bryant thing happened and, and everything was just like, man, what's going on? This is a weird start to the year, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, thinking that and then all of a sudden you start hearing about the coronavirus spreading in China and how it's starting to infiltrate other countries. And then before we knew it in February, here, here it is. COVID's on our shore. It's sweeping the nation. Uh, it's causing all of these problems. At first, you know, when they first announced the, the two weeks to flatten the curve thing and they, they announced that we wouldn't be able to go to church and stuff, I was like, dang, this is getting serious, you know, like this is kind of crazy, but I'm like, I didn't know what to think at the time. I was like, Hey, you know, we've got to stay safe. We don't want to die. We've got to be careful. And so I was kind of going along with everything. I was feeling okay. But then two weeks went by and it seemed like without even any notice, two weeks turned into three weeks, three weeks turned into four weeks, four weeks turned into five weeks. Around this time, I started to really think like, what's going on? Like we kind of still live in America and we kind of still have religious freedom. And I couldn't get past the fact that we weren't able to go to church. It drove me crazy because I, I was at church every Sunday before this. And, you know, that's where I, I felt like I was able to take a break from the world. And, that, you know, that's where I was able to recharge and all these things. And I was so frustrated that I couldn't go to church. But what was surprising me is that the longer all of this went on, the church wasn't saying anything. They weren't doing anything. They, they weren't standing up. They weren't saying, no, we're, we're starting church back up. Like our, our religious freedom is important. They weren't speaking up at all. That was a really big problem for me because I was raised being taught the prophecy that in the last days, the constitution would hang by a thread and the church would save it. The priesthood of God or however it's worded would save it. And so I always had this confidence that the church would be that refuge, that safe haven, that that place that would never uh, live by anything less than the Constitution. I started to get frustrated that we weren't able to go to church. Now, we were still doing Come Follow Me at home, and we were still doing the sacrament alone in our living room. And and to be honest, there were things that were beautiful about that. There's a lot of, of good that came out of that. Uh, we started to to go out into the mountains a lot and started camping more, fishing more, and just trying to seek God in other places since we couldn't seek him in the church building anymore. But as time went on, it wasn't just enough that the church had temples closed and had churches closed and had no end in sight of when we are going to finally put our foot down and start doing all of these saving ordinances again, all these things that were so important, so foundational to our church and our faith and our beliefs. Uh, it just seemed like none of it mattered anymore, like it didn't have to matter until later. And then I started listening to conference and conference started sounding like, and you know, the, a lot of the leadership in the church to me started sounding like an extension of the propaganda machine that was constantly surrounding us and overwhelming us as it was. And that bothered me a lot because I was like, I don't feel like this is a safe haven. I feel like this is just an extension of this crazy, screwed up world that we're living in. Where did the church go that I have believed in my whole life? What's going on? Up to this point, wasn't really questioning the church. A lot of this context is kind of retrospect. Uh, but at the time, I was thinking like, man, when is the prophet going to speak up and be like, hey, we got to get back to church. We got to do all these things, you know, like like our freedom matters. And uh, when is all this going to happen? Well, before I know it, they start encourage us, encouraging us to wear masks and to social distance, to be good citizens. Before I knew it, um, I remember thinking this whole time, I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe there's a reason why the church is going along with this. Maybe there's a reason why, you know, the prophet's not saying anything. Maybe there's a reason why, you know, they, they can't, maybe they're going to lose their tax exemption status. And all these things we're trying to think of and justify, like just stretching our imaginations as far as we could to, to, try and comprehend how the prophet was not doing anything about all of this. And I remember <clears throat> thinking like, okay, well, at least one thing's for sure. They're not going to push the jab on us. Like a true prophet of God surely would not push that on the world. And then all of a sudden in 2021, I think it was in July, all of a sudden the prophet did just that. He, he, the first presidency came out, released that email, encouraging everybody to go out and get the jab. I just remember being very shocked and bothered 
And it even led me to several days of, of praying and reflecting and, and asking God, Hey, should I get it? Am I wrong? You know, like the prophets saying that I should go get it. And he didn't leave any kind of room for like self, uh, personal revelation or praying about it for yourself. He didn't make any exceptions for underlining health conditions or risks or anything. He just said in clear writing, go out and get it. So I, I prayed and I was like, God, should, should I do this? Am I wrong? Help me to see my blind spots. Help me to know if I'm wrong about this. And I just felt really strongly that, that God had made clear what I'm supposed to do, that I wasn't supposed to get it and that I needed to be firm about it. And so I remember I ended up feeling moved upon by the spirit to, to do a post on Facebook. And in this post, I knew I had to, to really tread lightly because I didn't want it to come across like I was speaking out against the prophet or encouraging people to not listen to him. But I felt like it was so important for people to at least pray about this and really treat it as a serious personal decision that it was to not just go out and do it because the prophet said you should. I remember, you know, praying about it and, and starting to write this post out. And what I ended up saying in the post was just, hey, before you go out and just get it because the prophet said so, like, please pray about it. Please seek personal revelation. Please make sure that it's the right thing for you to do. I'm like, I don't know why the prophet said this. I don't know, you know, what he, but I personally feel strongly that myself and my family shouldn't get it. And I encourage you to pray about it too. The same thing that as missionaries, you tell, you invite investigators to do, you ask them to pray to know if these things are true, even though in your mind, you know that the only answer that would be right for them to receive is yes, you should get baptized. You still encourage them to pray about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I was doing. And I just remember getting lashed out against so severely by so many people, people calling me an apostate, people saying that I had lost my faith, that I was headed down a dark road that I'd never come out of. A lot of friends and family reaching out, expressing concern for my, my eternal salvation, basically. And I just remember being shocked by that because they all knew the testimony I had at the time. I was constantly posting religious you know, posts and stuff nonstop around this time. And to have the nerve to accuse me of apostasy when I was just encouraging people to pray um, about what the prophet had said. I remember it really just blowing my mind. And I think that that was the first time I started to feel resentment towards members of the church. And the first time I started to, to feel almost like a, a outlaw to the church, so to speak. Yeah. That's really surprising that you weren't even speaking out against the prophet. It was literally just, I don't want to do this thing that he's telling us to do. That is totally a personal decision between us and God. And that's what caused people to lash out. That's crazy. That's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a little bit in our pre-notes um, about how you were trying to figure out this thing in your head about how can God exist if the church wasn't true? Can you explain yeah. a little bit of what was going through your mind at the time about how can God be God without the church? Because in the LDS church, we're just taught that God and the church are the same. If if God is real, the church is real. Tell us a little bit about what that was like in your journey. Yeah. So that was really what kept me holding on to the church, you know, after I had been lashed out against. And I finally, for the first time, started to feel like I didn't relate with, with the common population of the church anymore. That's when I started to just really feel like things weren't right. You know, I started to do a lot of research. I started to see that the church was donating millions of dollars to UNICEF and was investing significant shares in, in Pfizer and a lot of other medicinal manufacturers. I started to just see all of these things happening. And I was just like, what is going on here? Like the church is not there for us the way that they promised they'd be. And, and uh, things don't feel right. But I remember every time I would have that question pop into my head, like, is the church true? Is there a chance that, that maybe it's not? I just would say, no, I'm not going to give up on God that easy. You know what I mean? Like I could not comprehend for a second how the church could be false, how the church could be alive, but God could still be real. My testimony of, of the church was so intertwined with my belief in God that I just could not comprehend. I wouldn't even open up to, to consider that possibility because in my mind, if I were to convince myself by reading whatever material I would come across or whatever was gonna happen, then I would cease to believe in God. 
And so I got to a point where I was like, I don't even care if the church is true anymore. I believe in God. And so I'm holding on for all I've got. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's the position that a lot of us were in when we were starting to experience that uh, cognitive dissonance during mm -hmm. COVID times. So definitely, totally understand. So oh, yeah. yeah, what happened next in your story? What was your next thing that kind of woke you up more? So the next big thing that happened, this was a couple of months later, uh, I guess a little bit of backstory. Uh, anyone who knows me has known for my entire life, they've known me to be a soda junkie. I, I drink a ton of soda, a ton of Mountain Dew. At this time, I was drinking a ton of energy drinks, uh, about one or two a day. Around uh, late November 2021, I decided to give up soda and energy drinks for a while. I wanted to take a break and I wanted to, to really try and eat cleaner, live cleaner. And so I had given it up. Well, I was struggling a lot with exhaustion and and uh, things like that because I had been dependent on caffeine my whole life. But I remember there was this one day that I had to drive from St. George up to uh, Salt Lake for, for something. I can't even remember what it was. And I was driving with my two boys in my truck. And as I was driving, I remember I was coming up on the Fillmore exit and I was just exhausted. Like I was falling asleep behind the wheel. I was nodding off. And I was like, man, I, I can't drink an energy drink. I've made this commitment to myself. I can't drink an energy drink. What else could I drink that would give me energy? And so I'm imagining as I'm driving in my truck, I'm imagining walking through the, the uh, gas station uh, fridge and looking at all of the, I was like scanning all of the drinks in my mind. And I'm trying to think, is there anything in there that's not an energy drink that has caffeine that can wake me up? And I just remember getting frustrated. I'm like, man, I think everything is either going to be a normal energy drink, a sugar-free energy drink or soda. What am I going to do? And I remember having this thought while I was driving, man, I really wish that God would have just created some kind of a natural energy drink, like some kind of a natural something that could give me energy. And it's so funny looking back that that was ever even a, a thought or a question. But as soon as that question popped into my head, an immediate it wasn't an audible voice, but I could, I could hear it in my mind and soul. I don't know how to explain it, but I could hear the words I did. And instantly I thought of coffee and tea that up to this point, it hadn't even crossed my mind. I forgot they existed because they have never been on the menu for a good Mormon boy, it's just never been on the menu. It's never been a possibility. And so I started thinking, I was like, okay, God's, seems to be kind of, you know, nudging me towards considering drinking coffee, I think. So I, I prayed and kind of reflected on it. And I was like, yeah, that is peculiar how I'm not supposed to drink coffee or tea like God created, but I've never been questioned on, you know, by a bishop when I'm in a, a temple recommend interview on energy drinks. Like I've always disclosed that just in case they have an issue with it. I've always disclosed in every bishopric interview, hey, just so you know, I'm an energy drink, you know, nut job. And a lot of times I'd get high fives from my bishop, you know, he'd be like, what, what's your favorite kind? You know, oh, I love this one. And it wasn't a big deal. But here I am trying to get away from that horrible poison that I was consuming and trying to figure out how to, to stay alive in a healthy way. And all of a sudden now I'm realizing that that God did create some kind of caffeinated beverage, you know, and so I remember praying kind of in my head, uh, asking God, you know, hey, I'm kind of thinking about this. What do you think? I felt really good about it. I called Carly and uh, asked her what she thought. She kind of laughed at me because she's like, "Down, like I've thought the whole time we've been married that you'd be way better off drinking coffee than all the energy <laughs> drinks you drink. Like, praise the Lord, you know. And she's like, yeah, go ahead. Like, if you feel good about it, like this is a personal thing. The word of wisdom is a personal thing. Go ahead and, and try it. And so I remember I got off the Fillmore exit and my kids were sleeping. So I wasn't going to go into Maverick if I didn't have to. So I ended up going across the freeway uh, to uh, Carl's Jr. <clears throat> and I end up pulling up to the window and ordering a coffee. And it's funny looking back because when I had ordered this coffee, you know, I, I just said, hey, uh, can I get a coffee? And the lady was like, sure. Any, do you want any cream or sugar? And I just asked her, uh, I don't know. What do people usually get? And she's like, sir, we have a lot of different people who order coffee a lot of different ways. She's like, I get a lot of people who ask for it black with nothing added. And I have a lot of people that drown it in 
and, you know, cream and sugar, it's up to you. And I just remember being overwhelmed with the feeling I ended up ordering and, and I ended up drinking it. And I just remember loving it. I remember being like, man, where's this been my whole life? Like, it felt like the, I didn't have the, as much of a rush and crash as I used to with energy drinks. I didn't have the headache from all of the synthetic corn syrup that I was used <laughs> to drinking, you know? And, uh, I just felt really, it felt like a really pure, healthy form of energy. And it, it changed my life. You know, I was able to, to drink coffee from then on and just feel more energized in a more healthy way. And I didn't feel like I had as many side effects from it. We were still active in the church around this time. I already had my temple recommend and it wasn't going to lapse for like another year. And so I was still just kind of praying about it and, and trying to be accountable to God and trying to sort out like how to navigate this now that I'm technically breaking the word of wisdom, even though I feel completely right with God about it. And uh, that was the second big thing that, that kind of helped me to, to think outside of the, the church's echo chamber a bit. Several months later, you know, we, we still, this whole time, we were back in church now. We were going to church, but things just didn't feel the same. Like there's still, most people were still wearing masks in church and there was still just all of these things going on. It just, uh, the church we, we had always joke about how we didn't feel like the church felt as true as it used to be. I just never really felt the same at church after 2020. I just could never feel the same. That question still continued to to race through my mind. Like, how can God be real and the church not be? If, if the church wasn't true, what was the true church? What church had his authority? What church is the church he established? Does it exist? Was it actually legitimately restored? And then it got screwed up by by conspiring men, like what happened that has led the church to being what it is today? Because it just does not feel, I don't feel at home here. I don't feel the spirit at church. I walk away from church every Sunday feeling just overwhelmed with anxiety and, and frustration and a raging headache every Sunday. And so this went on for a while, uh, kind of towards the spring of 2022, uh, Carly and I started, uh, my, my mom had actually started sending us some, some different videos from like Rob Fotheringham and Hemlock Knots and things kind of talking about church history stuff that like the church doesn't talk about, but is from the, the scriptures themselves, from the actual context of the church's, you know, teachings. Uh, it felt like a safe place to, to learn about church history without just going full blown like Mormon stories, digging deep into, you know, ex Mormon, you know, rhetoric. And so we started to kind of read some of those things. Uh, I started to learn a lot about like the early church and uh, about uh, the timelines of, of when certain revelations were actually revealed and, you know, different things like that. I started to learn a lot about Brigham Young and how different Brigham Young was from what I was raised to believe he was. Like I was raised to believe that he was this, this good, kind hearted, you know, strong leader of a man that, you know, faithfully led the saints from, from Nauvoo to Utah and all these things. But then I started to, to read about like some of the stuff that he did and the way that he uh, carried himself and, and how much of a tyrant he was, you know, my trust in the church started to kind of separate. One of the big topics that I had stumbled across was I had kind of researched the origins of the temple. Uh, Cause that was another big thing that bothered me. I was like, I would never leave the church cause I would never want to lose my eternal family, you know, and all these things. So I started to research the temple and like, okay, well, where does the temple come from? Where does the temple ceremony come from? What inspired it? What led to it? Things like that. And I started to learn a lot about how the temple, uh, the endowment session, the initiatory session, a lot of the symbols, clothing, a lot of that stuff actually originated from Freemasonry in Nauvoo. Uh, Joseph and Brigham and, and many other uh, foundational uh, early leaders uh, had, had joined Freemasonry and had started to study that, study it and participate in it. And that's kind of where the, the temple ceremony had come from. But I remember this one day, my wife and I, uh, were in Vegas celebrating our anniversary. And up to this point, you know, we, we weren't going to church much now. We were probably only going maybe once a month or so. Uh, we were drinking coffee, but that was about it. That was about as crazy as we got. We we're still wearing our garments and doing all of the right things. 
Uh, but I remember we we went to Vegas and we just wanted to have a, a nice getaway, you know, from the kids. And I remember we went shopping this one day and she's uh, in in a store looking at all of these sundresses that like are totally not garment, you know, worthy. Right. And I just asked her, I was like, what are you doing? You weirdo. Like, why are you looking at that stuff? Like you, you couldn't wear any of that with your garments. And, and she kind of looked at me nervously and she's like, yeah, but maybe I would occasionally. And I was like, what do you mean? Like you would not wear your garments occasionally? Like, are you serious? And she's like, let's talk about it in the car. So we go out and we sit in the car and we're talking and, and she starts telling me, she's like, okay, so I, I need you to hear me out on something. You remember how we didn't feel right about getting the jab and, and then the prophet said that we should get the jab and we didn't feel right about it. So we didn't. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember. She's like, okay, well, do you remember, you know, when, when we had that whole, you know, revelation about the word of wisdom and, and how we, you know, even though the church taught us that we should never drink coffee, how God told us something different and we followed that and it's worked out really well for us. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember. And she's like, well, I'm starting to have some serious conflicting questions and feelings about garments and, and I'm, I'm studying it out right now. I'm not making any decisions yet, but I'm starting to kind of feel like I might, you know, stop wearing my garments. And I was like, all right, hold up, you know, let's call the bishop. Let's get him on the phone. Let's, <laughs> let's confess all of our sins. Let's go back to church. Let's go all in. Let's, let's just dive headfirst right back into full membership status. You know, give us our callings. Like this is going too far. I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not doing this. You know, we're not going to risk our eternal family and our salvation and all this stuff. I started freaking out. And uh, she's like, don't freak out. You know, we'll, we'll take it slow. I promise I won't do anything until I really have come to fully know what I should do. You know, and I've really prayed about it. And I'm like, okay. And so we went home and a couple weeks passed. And I remember uh, this one morning I woke up and I can't remember what led to this thought. I just remember I was laying in bed and the thought just popped into my head out of nowhere to Google the Freemasonry logo. I'd never seen it before, at least not that I knew. I didn't know much about Freemasonry other than uh, I knew that there was a lot of, of bad and even satanic things, you know, to do with it. <clears throat> and so uh, I, I Googled the Freemasonry logo and then all of a sudden it pops up and my heart sunk because the Masonry logo is the square and the compass that we have on our garments. And I just remember thinking, um, Hmm, this is disturbing. Like I'm wearing these things. I've been told I have to wear them all the time, that it's part of my, you know, salvation and protection and all these things. But they have these symbols that obviously derive from a very evil place. And all of a sudden I just felt overcome with this feeling, like take them off, like get out of these things. And it was like this emergency, like I had to take them off. And so I remember just changing into to normal clothes, feeling really weird. I kind of went several hours that day before I even told Carly. And then finally I went up to her and I was like, hey, I beat you to it. Like I took my garments off. I'm not wearing them anymore. Like, look at this. And I showed her the logo and she freaked out. And, and that was kind of it. From then on, uh, we stopped wearing our garments and we were in really uncharted water because now we're like, okay, so we're starting to see you know, how the church might not be true and how God could still be real. Because if like the church isn't true and the leaders were deceptive in the beginning of the church's founding, then they could have also just, you know, brainwashed me to believe that there's a necessity for a true church and all of these things. And the puzzle pieces started to kind of come together, but it was all bad news because I was being shown everything that was wrong about what I was believing in, but I didn't know where to go. I had no idea where to go. And I think that for a lot of people, a lot of like my friends who have left the church and have gone atheist, I think that a lot of them had a similar moment like this where they didn't know what was next. They knew what wasn't true anymore, but they didn't know where to go. They didn't know where they could go that would be safe. And uh, this started to, to really eat at me. Another quick story that I'll tell you really quick is I remember this one time I, I had to pray about a really important decision. This was probably two or three months after 
um, taking my garments off. When I started to pray, I remember I was like trying to really meditate and really get to a place where I could really receive an answer on this question. And I remember I was praying and I was asking God like, hey, um, what do I do here? You know, but things just weren't clicking. Nothing was like happening in the prayer. And, you know, at the time I'm spe- I'm praying in the these, those lines, you know, I'm, I'm uh, praying like the church taught me to growing up. And I just felt like there wasn't any connection. And finally, I'm just like, you know, God, I pray that thy spirit will be here, you know, and all this stuff. And then I just all of a sudden, again, feel this voice. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard it in my throughout my body, you know, and it said, stop it with that. And I'm like, stop it with what? Like, I don't get it. And and I start praying again and I hear stop it with that. And I'm like, um, what's going on? You know, like stop it with what? And then all of a sudden I felt these words say, just talk to me. I'm your father. Just talk to me like your father. You don't have to throw in all of these, you know, elaborate, honorific language. Like you can just talk to me. And, uh, you know, and I remember I'm like, okay. So I, for the first time in my life, started to pray, you know, without all of that fancy language and just started to just focus on connecting with God. And that was another huge foundational, like, learning experiences in this process of learning to connect with God through sincere prayer. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. That's very similar to, I think, a lot of our awakening journeys where we learn that we can just talk to God. like He's our father because he is, and that's how he, he doesn't want these rote prayers that we have, you know, formed that are, you know, like you said, these, the speech that we use and like, to be honest, I still, I, I see myself throwing thee and thou in my prayers like so often because it's so ingrained in me. And I, I don't think God is like, you know, upset when I do that, but it's just more of like, a, yeah, that's from the whole culture that I was raised in. And so it's really freeing to just talk to God in that way. Yeah. And to be clear about that, I'm glad that you mentioned that because like, I'm not implying by any means that God doesn't like when we speak in honorific language or English or whatever that is. Um, I think that it's really a personal thing and, and that's what I've really come to learn. I can't wait to get into like the things I've come to learn because that's one thing I've really come to learn is that there isn't just a one true anything. There's not a one true way to pray. There's not a one true way to connect with God. There's not a one true church. Um, God really is. He, he just cares about connection. I think that it's obvious now reading the New Testament that, that Jesus cared so much more about connection than structure and formality and all the things that the church focuses on. Jesus was so much more focused on the hearts of the people, the intentions, the relationships, you know, all of the other stuff is just distractions. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Jesus wants us to meet him the way we are. He wants us in all of our mess, all of our raw feelings. My prayers have changed too in that like sometimes my prayers are just a passionate cry to God. Like sometimes it's half yelling because <laughs> I'm like, this is too hard. What do you want from me? And, you know, you think that's when you're in the church, you think that's almost sacrilegious in a way, but it's it's just laying it all out for God. He wants that. He wants to meet us there so he can then carry us into a better place. And when I meet God in that really raw place, he transforms it into something beautiful so I can heal from those raw things. And that's mm-hmm. one of the transformations I think we've seen and what you're describing in your journey as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So tell me a little bit about your decision to leave the church and um, kind of your thought process along with that, because a lot of it's like you said, a lot of people just assume we leave because we're offended or because we weren't super faithful. We what was kind of, yeah, we want to sin, which it's I was thinking about that, too, when you were talking about how we need to go and confess all of our sins. And I'm thinking your sins are what you didn't get the jab and you're drinking coffee. Like, it's just oh, yeah. like, funny. I was about to be the next guy in line at Rite Aid just getting jabbed to the the hilt, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'm changing everything I've done that's led us to this point. Um, mm-hmm. But no, I um, I think one thing that I would really want people listening to understand is that this was not a rash decision. You've got to understand, I was obnoxiously devoted to the church to the point where even my bishops were like, dude, you need to chill out. Yeah, you you just need to to like relax a little bit, you know? I was very, very prayerful about my decision to leave the church. It was not a rash thing. It was not a, oh, 
screw the church, you know, I, I'm not getting the jab and, and the prophet can take a hike. It was nothing like that. It was a very raw, emotional, intense, very deeply prayed about experience. And I prayed about every little detail of it, you know, even different bits of information that I would get, I would verify their sources. I would uh, pray and ask God if it's true or if it's deception. I was so thorough in wanting to make sure that whatever I did was going to be God-centered and God-focused. And me leaving the church, if I'm being completely real, and this is going to sound crazy to to any uh, believing members that may watch this, I left the church at the end of the day because I wanted as strong and as deep and as uninterrupted of a connection with my Savior as I could possibly have. And I was shown by God how many ways the church was. And, you know, in many ways, the church provided a platform for me to to learn about Jesus and to go on a mission and, and have that experience. Like the church wasn't all bad by any means, but it was now becoming a distraction. It was now becoming a stumbling block in my walk with God because all these things that God are telling me to do are strictly opposed by the church and its members. Like even something as simple as not getting the jab was so appalling to so many members and it was so bad and I was just so bad for not doing it. You know, um, I started to realize really throughout 2020 how amazing it felt to just instead of going to church for three hours on Sunday and like spending my whole time teaching 11 year olds in primary or whatever I was doing to be able to go into the mountains and just connect with my family, connect with myself, connect with nature, connect with God, like how deeply I felt God during that process. And during that time, how good I felt when instead of going to church, even after church was, was back in business, like there were several Sundays where we're like, Hey, I, I actually want to feel the spirit today. So instead of going to church, let's go, you know, let's go fishing. Let's go in the mountains. Let's take the kids and, and do, go on a, a bike ride in the hills, whatever. And we started doing that. And I just started to feel so much closer to God when I wasn't trying to force myself to believe the church was true. Um, all of a sudden, all of those distractions, all of these men, the, my bishop and my stake president and and my the, the prophet and the apostles, all these people who I was convinced had to be between me and God had to, I couldn't have a relationship with God without them. It all started to change. I can definitely say with confidence that I was very prayerful and that ultimately I left the church out of a desire to devote myself more wholeheartedly to God. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. So I want to go into a little bit. We talked before this episode about your story about your tattoo. And I want to talk about this because it's such a misconception when you're in the church that I know, at least for me, like the men that had tattoos, they were like this, like really rough around the edges kind of guy, because <laughs> it's not the thing that you do in the church. Right. And so um, seeing you and hearing your story, you're obviously not like a rough around the edges kind of guy. <laughs> and that wasn't not really a tattoo sleeve kind of guy either, if I'm being <laughs> real. Right. So I want to kind of share with our audience what you've shared with me before about your tattoo and what made you decide to get that and kind of the meaning behind it for you. Absolutely. Thank you for asking that. Uh, I was having a hard time figuring out how to fit it in my story here. But with a tattoo, you know, I uh, I remember my first time looking at a tattoo sleeve and thinking, dang, like, that's pretty sweet. You know, like, I wish I could get one was a couple years prior to 2020. One of my mission companions from the mission, uh, I had kept in really close contact with him. He had gone and gotten one. And at this time, I didn't really know if he was like still in the church. And he just said, forget it and go do it or what led to that. Um, but I remember seeing his his sleeve and hearing the meaning behind it and just thinking it was so cool, like uh, all of the symbolism that it had and and how he it told the story of who he was on his arm, you know, and I was secretly really jealous of that. But I still, you know, a worthy priesthood holder would never do that, you know, and I was I was not going to do it. Well, of course, as soon as I start to come to terms with the fact that I didn't believe in the church anymore, that was the first place my mind went is, ooh, like, 
maybe you can get a sleeve now, you know, but I wasn't rushing into it. I, I still, you know, was very indoctrinated. I still very much believed everything that the church taught me about, you know, tattoos and how bad they are. Um, however, this, this image just kept growing within me. Uh, first off a desire to, to separate my past as like a, a Peter priesthood in the church to my, my future as like being devoted to God, I guess to being willing to follow what I felt was right, no matter what. And like making a clear statement that to myself and to others that I'm not going back, even though I knew the church would take me back, you know, with my tattoos and all of that, if I ever went back, I really wanted to make a statement for myself and for others to know, Hey, this is me now. And I'm, I'm drawing my line, in the, my line in the sand. I'm not going back, you know? And so I started to really reflect. I was like, okay, I think I'm going to get one at the time I was making really good money and I knew that I would you know, be able to afford it. And so I started to, to kind of think about symbolism and what I knew I wanted was I wanted a sleeve that, that really talked and told a story uh, similar to my mission companions, uh, told a story about who I was, what my core values were. And so I started to like research symbolism on all these different topics and things. And it led to, to the sleeve that I ended up getting. And so I'll kind of, I'll kind of show everybody, um, kind of show everybody the different uh, tattoo pieces I have. So um, this first part, this is the first part I had done here. This is obviously the American flag it says we, the people I'm very patriotic. I, I love our country. I believe in its founding. I believe in the constitution. And I really wanted to emulate that on my arm. Uh, this right here is uh, a lion. Uh, and the lion represents two things at once. Uh, the first thing that it represents is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Um, but it also represents my determination to follow him and to be devoted to him. And uh, I don't know if you can really see well in the lighting and everything, but there's a particular part of this line in, in particular that I was really, really picky about. And that was like the look in the tight of the lion's eyes. I wanted this lion to portray strength. I wanted the lion to portray love. And I wanted the lion to be something, a force to be reckoned with, something to fear, you know. Um, something that that evil would would flee from, you know, and so I was very, very particular about how I wanted the lion to be portrayed. Um, also, right here, this is the lone wolf. Uh, originally, I had a different piece here. Um, I had switched up tattoo artists. I uh, wanted to save some money and I wanted a tattoo artist that was closer to home because I was going to one in Vegas at the time. Um, and I had a, a piece done that was just awful. I don't even want to say what it was. If I showed you a picture, you'd laugh. It was really terrible. Um, but my original artist was able to cover it up with this. And what the lone wolf represents is being willing to, to do the right thing, being willing to stand for truth, even if it means that I'm all alone. Um, and then I'll stand up to show you this next part. <clears throat> so uh, right here. Uh, is my kids on a hiking trail in the mountains. This kind of is a, a piece to to connect me with where I was in 2020 and where I found God, like where I really found and made a strong relationship with God. Um, it was with my kids and my family in the mountains. And um, I wanted to, to really capture that moment uh, permanently. <clears throat> and then this eagle obviously represents freedom, not just patriotic freedom, you know, love of country type thing, but also my, my freedom in my new life. Uh, this moon, because the wolf had to be darkened so much because it was a cover up, <clears throat> we added the moon and darkened this up just to kind of make it look like nighttime and make it make some sense. Mm -hmm. um, but this last tattoo is really shocking. Uh, I think that most people would be surprised that I chose to do this after leaving the church. Um, but do you know who that is? Yep. Captain Moroni. <laughs> yep. Captain Moroni. And mm -hmm. uh, it's <clears throat> the depiction of Captain Moroni uh, from <clears throat> a Walter Rain painting called Come Forth. Uh, it was a really powerful picture that I remember seeing when I was a teenager. And I remember <clears throat> looking at this picture it was at a, 
uh, St. George open house, like art exhibit, uh, in their visitor center. <clears throat> and, uh, and I just remember looking at this, it was a life-size photo of Captain Moroni or a life-size, uh, drawing. And I just remember just being so deeply impacted. Like I saw how Moroni was standing and the power that he was standing with. And I just thought that's who I need to be. Like, that's what I need to emulate. That's how I need to stand for God. And so even though I'm at a point where I don't, uh, I don't know what to believe about the Book of Mormon, I'm still trying to sort a lot of that out. But whether he was a real character or a real person or a fictional character, I love that story. And I love what Captain Moroni stands for. And I feel like I connect very well with that character, whether truth or fiction, um, in a very deep way. And that's why I put it on my arm. Yeah, I love that. I love Captain Moroni. like so much. And so I think I love your, your rawness too here and that, you know, you're admitting, I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers. I'm still trying to seek to know about the Book of Mormon about things. And you know what, that's okay. Cause we're all on our journey to, to know the truth. And so, you know, I think it's awesome that you put Captain Moroni on that. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Yeah. I've never, I've never showed that in a public setting. I've never like announced that to where most people would see it. And so there you go. <laughs> I love the symbolism behind all of it. I think I think the symbolism is beautiful. So thank, thank you. you for sharing that with us and that little unique part of your journey. Let's transition. Let's talk about what are some of the hardships you have experienced since leaving the church? It's usually not just this easy thing. We wake up one day and we're like, we're out of here. Like we're busting out of prison. Okay. It's not yeah. like that. <laughs> so tell us what the hardships were like for you. This is a real can of worms you've just opened. <laughs> Um, so I, I really felt in preparation for this video that I needed to be, uh, really honest and really raw about this topic, because I think that there's no doubt, uh, for all of us who've left the church, for people who are thinking about leaving the church, I'm going to be honest with you. It is not easy. And I think that the, the hardest part about it is, you know, we were raised believing all of these things. And there was so much philosophy of men mingled with scripture in the church that it's so hard to sort through all of it. And on top of that, you also have the issue of the church telling you, you know, everyone sat in a uh, testimony meeting or in an institute class where somebody's sharing a story about somebody who decided to to go camping instead of going to church one Sunday or or whatever. And before you knew it, they were leaving the church and shooting up with drugs and, you know, and their life was dark. And and then, you know, some of them some of them died in their sin and, and they cried because they're not going to go to heaven. And then other people, you know, finally came back and all of this truth and light and knowledge was restored. Um, we've all heard so many stories like that, so many stories of the the promised blessings that we're missing out on by not being a part of the church. Was it M. Russell Ballard who said, you know, if, if you leave the church, where will you go? Right? Yeah, yeah, that was him. I'm pretty sure. Um, all of these things we've been conditioned and and really what what they are is is scare tactics yes. that we've been under for our whole lives and that's why we've never thought about leaving the church because we have been warned that even thinking about it, even wondering if this thing the prophet told you to do and and praying about it and getting an answer from God you shouldn't and deciding not to do it, that alone is apostasy. And you're gonna you're gonna suffer fire and brimstone, all these things are gonna be a son of perdition. I mean, all of these things go into your head. And then on top of that, another layer is God you know, was always taught to us as this really, you know, jealous God, almost like Old Testament God rather than New Testament God. You know, uh, if you mess up, you know, you better, you better repent. You better, you better pray and ask God for forgiveness, you know. Um, oh, and if, if you messed up bad enough, then you, you need church disciplinary action. You're going to have to go this many weeks without the sacrament and you may have to have your records removed and, and you're going to have to meet with your bishop twice a week for the next, you know, six months to even have a hope of being forgiven for this awful, atrocious thing you've done. And, and we get programmed. We, we start to believe and see God. I think at least a lot of us as this dictatorial, impossible to please CEO of the universe that just punishes you, that, that sends down lightning rods every time you mess up. I mean, I'm obviously 
exaggerating a little bit like the the conflict here but i think that that all of us can somewhat relate to to having somewhat of an image like that of god in our minds like he's a loving god who loves us but there's severe consequences if we go astray there's severe con- consequences if we know the fullness of the truth and we stray from it right Right. And it's, it's a fear-based thing. This is the problem is that it's a fear-based thing. The scriptures do teach that we are supposed to repent, that we're supposed to run to God with these things. But that doesn't mean that we're supposed to be absolutely horrified that he's going to destroy us every time we make a mistake because he's so loving and he wants us to come to him so that he can then grow us into a better place. It's exactly. so much more beautiful than the fear tactics that the church is using. Exactly. And and all of us have heard, you know, about how so-and-so left the church church and then all of a sudden their business fell apart and they got divorced and their their lives you know crumbled and all these horrible things happened they they got this terminal disease and i mean you, you know you've heard those stories well aside from from immediate harm and and terminal illness befalling me and my family i i literally feel like almost every other thing i was ever told would happen if i left the church did i'm going to be honest almost all of it happened um, as soon as I started, and and I hope that for many people that their experience doesn't have to be this this hard. Um, but again, I came from a very very strict, uh, fear based you know family uh, unit. You know, um, very critical. I guess is the word I'm looking for. Family um, from mostly my my dad and his side of the family. You know, if if you made any kind of mistake, the kind of backlash you would get was always pretty extreme. Well, as soon as I started to to voice my concerns publicly, I had so many family members and friends, you know, reaching out, expressing their disapproval, you know, making a lot of of, uh, rude comments. Um, I I was starting to just not feel welcome in certain friend circles. um, And just so much was happening. Well, around the same time, my mom, who had sent us some of those videos, you know, uh, earlier on, had left the church about the same time as my wife and I did. And because of that, my dad got super angry and uh, he could not live with the fact that she didn't believe in the church anymore and she wasn't wearing her garments anymore. And so he kind of went crazy about it. Uh, and they ultimately ended up uh, getting a divorce. And uh, when they got a divorce, my mom didn't have anywhere to go. And so I offered her to, to stay with me uh, and my family. And so her and my two brothers moved in. And the plan was just for them to, to live with us until the divorce was finalized and they got everything settled. And then uh, hopefully she would get back on her feet. Well, between leaving the church and the disapproval that was already being very clearly expressed by my family, and the fact that my my mom had left my dad and I had supported her. We left the church together. Now they think that there's some kind of conspiracy, you know, something or other going on between me and my mom. And then all of a sudden, my entire family, even many of them who had their own issues with my dad and had also distanced themselves from my dad because of his behavior in the past, so many of them uh, completely sided with him and lashed out against me. I wasn't being invited to family parties anymore. I wasn't on family group threads anymore, unless ironically, my grandma was sharing something uh, about how we needed to, to, you know, believe in the church or whatever, sharing some kind of church stuff. I had family members posting uh, about uh, just making really condescending posts on Facebook about uh, how disappointed they are watching people who had testimonies in the church leave because they wanted to sin and live the good life and all of these things that they are saying. Um, It ended up leading to a lot of severe anxiety and depression for me. I became so consumed with all of this stuff that was going on, feeling rejected by family, uh, feeling like people who used to to love and respect me now completely want nothing to do with me. I had several friends removing me from Facebook or every time we would talk, making really cynical comments to me. And I got to a point where I just felt so depressed and I felt so dark and lonely. I felt like I had my mom and my wife and a couple of friends, and that's all that I had that I could count on, that I could still trust is there for me, still loves me. And because of that, uh, I got so tied up in that, that the business I was running at the time, I had my own finished carpentry and painting business. 
I started to get so consumed that I couldn't put my focus there anymore. I wasn't able to focus on bringing a new business, uh, making sure jobs were ending on time, making sure the quality was staying good. The business just slowly started to fall apart and crumble before my eyes. And there was nothing I could do because I was so overcome with anxiety all of the time that I just couldn't think I couldn't function. There's, it just felt like there was nothing that I could do. Ultimately, my business ended up completely going under. It wasn't sustainable. I couldn't keep it going anymore. I ended up at the time I had four full-time employees that I cared about deeply. Um, I had to, to let all of them go. Uh, I started selling all of our the painting vans, all of the tools, everything that I owned, uh, both from the business and like my motorcycle, my bicycles, all of my toys, everything I had acquired. I was living a very bougie lifestyle at the time. And I started having to sell all of that just to keep the bills paid. I started traveling around the country and trying to find different opportunities. I had done a lot of door-to-door -door sales when I came home from my mission. And so I tried a couple of door-to-door -door sale companies trying to just make whatever work. It's funny because all these things I was trying to keep the bills paid and to keep the lights on, all these things I was trying were falling flat on their face. I felt like they're like I had completely lost, like I had completely lost the ability to make money and to prosper. Like I could not fathom in my mind how I could prosper anymore because I didn't even know who I was. I didn't have family anymore. I was all alone. But periodically I would hear the voice of God in that same way I had before check in. And in my deepest moment, in my most dark moments, I would feel God say, are you ready to trust me yet? Are you ready to trust me yet? And I would get so frustrated because I'm like, God, dude, listen, I have trusted you so much. Like I've trusted you so much. I left the church that I believed in my whole life for you. I've given up all of these things to follow you. I'm trying my best to be a good person, but I don't even know what good is anymore. I don't know what to believe. I don't know what's good, what's bad, what brings me blessings, what brings me curses. I don't know what's going on and I'm doing my best. I'm trying to provide for my family. I'm trying to bring in money. I'm trying to make all of this happen and nothing's coming of it. Like literally nothing's coming of it, God. And I would just get so frustrated, but he was just always there to remind me, are you ready to trust me yet? Are you ready to trust me yet? You know, I, I really love what you're saying here because on top of that, there's also all these people that you're getting backlash from that I'm sure you were experiencing at the time. All the time. And so we discussed this on our episode with Brianna Wright, where when you're in the church, everybody says, see the good, see the good. We're just supposed to see the good, which almost means ignore the bad. But then it's such an irony that the second you leave the church, then all that anybody wants to point out is the bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yes, it's such an irony what's happening in their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But you know what? I love that you're sharing the bad because life is a mixed bag of the good and the bad. And in order to see like this beautiful journey that God has given us, we have to see both, and we have to engage with both, and then we truly understand what Jesus really did for us on that cross and how he is constantly sustaining us in our life. And you're really illustrating this in your story, so I love it. Thank you. And, and I'll add to that. The resurrection means nothing without the cross, without what he suffered. And um, I had so many moments in this journey where I would just be like, God, what the heck? Like, come on, where are those blessings that you used to dish out pretty handsomely? Like what's going on? And I would be reminded of scriptures like, you know, um, I can't think of exact ones just from the top of my head. I'm ne I've never been great at quoting scripture, but you know, where God, where Jesus tells us to take up his cross and follow him, you know? And, and I was reminded so many times throughout the process, like, come on, if Christ suffered all that he suffered, being perfect, having no sin, literally being a God, um, why would I expect to not have to suffer at all? The problem is that I didn't really understand at this time, again, I, I had no idea where the lines between right and wrong were anymore. I would have to pray about every little thing that I did. And I was like, I don't know. Is it bad? To, is it really bad to drink? You know, is it really bad to do this? Is it really bad to do that? Like, am I a horrible person for not going to some kind of church service on Sunday? Should I be paying a 10% tithe to whatever church I'm going to? There's so many things I did not know 
how to navigate. And I didn't know where I was at with God. And I was still on this whole blessing and punishment mindset of if I'm not doing the right things, I'm being, or if I'm doing the right things, I'm being blessed. If I'm not doing the right things, I'm being punished. And, you know, from within the church, it's so funny because, you know, you look at people who've left the church and they've got the darkness in their eyes and all these things that people say about people who leave the church and all these horrible things that, that happen, you know, it's like, oh, Dallin, you know, lost his business and he's struggling and he can't figure life out. He shouldn't have left the church. You know, you see all these things as, as punishments from God or as, God trying to put you through the refiner's fire so that you'll come back. But what they don't talk about is that within the church, members of the church, when they're living righteously and doing all the right things, well, guess what? Crappy stuff still happens to them. But when you're an active member of the church, these terrible things that happen to you are uh, are trials, trials of your faith. But if you're out of the church, these bad things that happen to you are because you're not living righteously and God can't bless you. And it's this this double talk that they do, and it's so unfair to the people who leave because I'm going through probably something I would have gone through anyways had I stayed with the church. You know, it's looked at by everyone as a completely different thing. Yeah, there needs to be a big perspective shift because, and this is like across all Christian denominations across the board that, and I, I know this within my own journey, my own suffering, that there's this thing of like, oh, well, if you're suffering, it's because you have some sin or you're not praying hard enough or whatever. And it's very common misconception. That's not how God works. He's not just sitting there waiting to punish us. And these trials that we go through, they are our refining fire. We have to go through them, whether we're in the church or out of the church or wherever we're at in our journeys. And when we see it again, then you have this perspective of what Jesus really did for us. And like you said, the resurrection doesn't mean anything if we don't have the cross. You have to have the cross to have the resurrection. It makes a really big difference when we kind of have that perspective shift. So tell us a little bit about how you maintained your faith in God in this journey and some of the things you did, the steps you took to get closer to God as you're going through all this turmoil and kind of how God brought you out and delivered you out of this turmoil. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely another loaded question. And I guess the first thing that I would say is that the hardest part of leaving the church without a shadow of a doubt was no longer having a, a dogma or a set of teachings or a, a church leader that I could blindly trust in. I had spent my whole life blindly trusting in the one true gospel, the restored gospel, all of these things, the, the only true gospel, right? And so I could just believe that. I could just listen to what the prophet said and do it and not think about it. I could just listen to counsel from my bishop and do it and not think about it. And it seemed like when I was in the church, if I was in a trial or having an issue, all I had to do was either bury myself deeper within the prophet's words, you know, until I felt better or whatever, or I would go and talk to some kind of a church leader and they would, you know, talk me through it. But a lot of it came down to blind faith, blind trust in what I could see. And I didn't realize that then. I could see what the church was saying. I could see what my priesthood leaders were telling me to do. I was told that I was supposed to listen to them and trust in them and follow their counsel. And so it's easy to know what to do, right? Well, now I'm in uncharted waters. I'm in uncharted territory trying to figure everything out. One of the first things I really had to do was, again, separate the church's truthfulness from uh, my faith in Jesus Christ. I had to, to, to really just take all of the stuff I didn't know about. You know, like questions like, is the Book of Mormon true or is it not? Was Joseph Smith... did? Was Joseph Smith actually called a God or was he not? Was it all made up? Was only some of it made up? Was Joseph Smith an amazing prophet of God? And then Brigham Young came in and blew it all up. Like what happened, you know? And I eventually got to a point where I was going so crazy trying to sort through all of that and figure everything out that I finally just decided I had to throw all of that away and focus on what I did know. And what I did know is that I had a father in heaven. I had a savior in named Jesus Christ. I had a Bible that taught me about who he was. And those are the only things that I knew that I could with confidence hold on to. And so I held on to those for dear life. And um, 
you know, at first I was really confused because now I'm thinking, okay, well, if this isn't the true church, then what church is the true church? If this church doesn't have God's priesthood authority, then what, what church does have God's priesthood authority? Do none of them have the authority? You know, is the church going to have to be re-restored? Is it going to have to be restored the right way? What's going on, right? And, um, and one thing that really helped me through this whole faith journey, it's something I feel like I owe a lot of credit to, is the series The Chosen. It helped me so much to, to start to see Jesus in a different way. And I find it really interesting because several of the writers on the writing team uh, from The Chosen I've heard are members of the church. Yet Jesus is portrayed so differently in The Chosen than the Jesus I had grown up believing in. First off, you know, it makes a lot of sense that the Jesus they chose to play Jesus in The Chosen wasn't Caucasian. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, he was Middle Eastern and things like that. I started to kind of think like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. But there was <clears throat> one episode in particular uh, that really, really helped get me on the right track. And this episode was in season one, uh, episode three. And uh, this was my first time watching The Chosen. Carly was the one who was like, hey, since we're kind of trying to figure things out, I think this would be a good thing to keep us kind of grounded and keep Jesus on our hearts, you know. So she's the one who talked me into watching it. <clears throat> but I was watching episode three, and this is the episode where Jesus comes to Simon, Andrew, uh, and them on the water and uh, blesses them with a multitude of fishes, right? But that whole episode, I'm watching Simon go through all of this struggle. He's struggling to figure out how he's going to pay all of these debts. He's buried financially. There's no hope for him. He's this close to going to jail. If he doesn't come up with miracle money now. And I just remember that whole episode thinking, man, I relate so much to this. Like, I feel like I'm in the 11th hour, the last watch of the night, completely done for I'm financially about to collapse. What do I do? At the end, Jesus shows up. He blesses them with, with so much fish that so many fishes that the boats almost capsize and all of that, just like the story in the Bible. And uh, I just remember relating so much to Simon. And when Jesus invited Simon to follow him, and I can't remember details and exactly what made me realize this, but I just realized in that moment, I'm like, if I want to be okay, if I want this crazy, terrible nightmare that I'm living to go away, the only hope I have is following Jesus. And that's when I was finally able to throw away all of those extra questions that I felt like I had to find an answer to. I was able to throw all of those out and just focus on him and just focus on deepening my relationship with him. And that's something that that helped so much. Another thing that we ended up doing, I started reading the New Testament on my own, now with a different lens, with different context to kind of think about things. Instead of reading the verses and remembering what the prophet or whatever teacher told me I was supposed to interpret that as, I was able to read it now and and feel my own answers, you know, and pray about, about what those things meant. And uh, that deepened my, my faith. Uh, we also decided it would be a lot better to start going to to regular Christian churches rather than just completely like not having anything. And we're like, yeah, we're, they're probably wrong about a lot of stuff, but, you know, at least we can go and connect with people who are like minded and, and maybe learn some things. And I'll tell you what, choosing to start going, we started going to non-denominational Christian churches. I didn't want to even hear any other religious dogma. Uh, at least until I had kind of figured out where I'm going first and where God's leading me. <clears throat> but going to these non-denominational churches was such a powerful experience. I remember <clears throat> my very first time uh, walking in, we were going to SMCC in St. George. And as we're walking in, we're running late because, you know, we, again, we're really good Mormons. We are still on Mormon standard time. And <clears throat> I'm walking into the church and I hear the drums going the drums and the electric guitar inside. And I'm like, Oh Lord, save me. You know, this is going to be weird. Like drums in church. Okay. Well never experienced it before. Let's try it. 
And I was just blown away that first Sunday. I was blown away by like how strong the spirit was there. Like I always imagined, and I, I'm sure some churches get a little too crazy and irreverent with this stuff, but I always imagined it was just really irreverent, really, you know, bad and distracting. But man, like the, the singers and the music, you could just feel it from every fiber of your being rather than just singing the same hymn, you know, or almost moaning the same hymn to an organ you know, in, in Mormon church, now I'm listening to like people really pour their heart out through music and express the, the things that were on their heart through beautiful music and started to learn amazing things. Uh, we weren't super fond of the pastor at SMCC. So we started to kind of explore a little bit. We ended up finding another church that we absolutely loved. I highly recommend it for anyone who lives in St. George. It's called Hilltop. I had some life-changing experiences listening to to these pastors and the way that they would deliver their messages and everything. It was so influential and so touching. Um, I, I had such amazing experiences at that church. And one other thing just really quick that I want to focus on is another really big misconception I always had about Christian churches, especially non-denominational churches, is that the pastors and the people there can sniff out a Mormon from the parking lot. You know what I mean? And as soon as you're like walking up to the church, they're going to crowd you and they're going to first ask you, you know, what you believe. And if you're a Mormon and if they find out you're a Mormon, they're going to attack you and, and try and poison your mind and take away all your beliefs. And, and it's so funny because I've now uh, long-term attended six different churches since I've left the church. And I have not had one pastor say one negative thing about the church. Not one. None of them have tried to change my mind. None of them, even when I was still uh, holding on to the Book of Mormon really strongly, none of them uh, tried to get me to not believe in that. They just wanted to pour into me and be a support and a loving, you know, uh, support network to be able to build my faith, our faith. And it was an amazing experience. As we were kind of looking for a uh, place, a new place to live and a new job opportunity, we're still starting to, we're still struggling more and more financially. We're starting to sell things that I didn't even think were worth money just to keep the bills paid, you know. And uh, I had this this opportunity uh, to, to fly to Orlando and go uh, listen to this pastor speak that I had heard amazing things about from a lot of people that I knew. Uh, there was kind of this this network that my mom was a part of that that knew of him. And I went out there because I just felt like something in my heart was drawing me to, to meet this man, this pastor. So I went out to Orlando and I was there for Easter weekend and I listened to his sermons, had some one on one conversations with him and just remember feeling so whole. And I just remember feeling so good. Um, and I felt like that was the place that that we needed to start to rebuild our faith. We had spent so much time deconstructing. We realized that if we didn't start reconstructing, if we didn't start building our testimonies back up in something we knew was right, uh, then we were going to be uh, in trouble, you know. And so we uh, ended up deciding to move out to Orlando. I got a really uh, exciting job offer that I was cer certain was going to be the answer to our financial problems. We ended up selling the rest of everything that we had, furniture, you name it, packed up everything that we owned in two small cargo trailers and started driving to Orlando. We ended up getting there in, in June, had a really great time going to, to church every Sunday. We started to really learn and grow a lot. But this whole time, I was still struggling to trust God. I still felt like there was something wrong, like he was punishing me or he hated me or maybe he wasn't there at all. I didn't really know. But I was trying to hold on to my faith. We ended up just learning so much and having such a good experience that uh, we we ended up deciding to get rebaptized. Tell us a little bit about your rebaptism experience. I know when Carly posted that video on her YouTube channel, I was like so excited for you guys when I watched that. My heart was just like, yes, <laughs> good job, guys. Oh, yeah. So tell me a little bit about that experience for you guys and what that was like. Thank you. So from the time that we got to Orlando, you know, and honestly, even a little bit before <clears throat> we had started thinking like, man, should we get rebaptized? You know, like it was our baptism that we had valid and, 
And, you know, can it be valid if we didn't even have sins at the time because we were children? You know, I know that the age of accountability, according to Mormonism, is eight. But even then, like I had had two days maybe to sin, you know, before I got baptized. It just didn't make sense. Um, but what I felt more and more was a need to lay down my old life to, to kind of seal up the deconstruction journey I had been on, let go of my past beliefs and start to be reborn and start this journey from scratch. And uh, I knew that I wanted to be rebaptized by the time I got to Florida. I just didn't know when I wanted to really feel like my heart was right. And like every the timing was right. And I just wanted to feel like everything was good to go. Carly felt ready already. Um, but I just wasn't quite sure yet that I was like sufficiently changed or whatever to do it. Um, but what I did know is that I loved this pastor. He became like a father figure to me. The, the amount of love and support and encouragement that he gave me, how much he helped me to find who Jesus really is. Uh, I, I knew that I wanted him to do it. Uh, we had this... Uh, we decided to get baptized and I made a special request to my pastor. Uh, we usually would get, they would usually do baptisms the last Sunday of every month, right after church, we'd all go out and there's this really cool venue with like this, this giant, like uh, uh, cattle trough type thing that had the name of the church on it. And then there's this big cross behind it with like this beautiful lake and farmhouse and this farm in the backdrop. It was so beautiful. And uh, we would usually go out there and do our baptisms. <clears throat> well, as I'm coming up on the end of June, I start thinking, man, the, the 4th of July is coming up. My favorite day of the year. I love the 4th of July. I live for it. Uh, I keep those fireworks stands in business. You know, I've always been just a diehard, you know, patriot. I've always loved the 4th. But this this year, it felt different. I was like, normally I celebrate the independence and the freedom of my my country, right? Um, but I wanted to have this re rebirth experience. Like I wanted to be born again on this special day. I wanted it to be my anniversary of finding spiritual freedom. And so I asked my pastor, we are going to have this big church, uh, uh, activity this day. And I had asked my pastor if we could do the baptism there. And he did, he let us get baptized there. And uh, it was such a cool experience. Um, I think that even though I still had so far to go in my faith journey, I really felt like that was the dividing line between deconstruction and spiritually almost reaching a level of rock bottom to beginning to rebuild and, and go, get to where I'm at today and where God has yet to take me. Yeah, that is so beautiful. I love just, it's like a story of redemption and all after all that you've been through, you have this beautiful moment to just conceal, like to seal in your relationship with Jesus in a way. And so I think that's, that's beautiful. And I could feel that. I could feel that just by watching your video of you guys getting baptized. So, thank you. So tell us a little bit about your journey, kind of leaving that church and moving to another location and kind of the contrast between what's it like leaving the Mormon church compared to leaving a Christian church just to go somewhere else? <laughs> what's that like? Yeah. So, well, I mean, you, you've already expressed what leaving the Mormon church was like, right. you know, it was a very dark and lonely, uh, experience, but, uh, I guess a little bit of backstory to what led to us leaving Orlando uh, was while we were there, um, this job opportunity that I thought was just going to be amazing. I thought I was going to make all this money and, and it was just going to be fine and dandy. Well, when I got there and they actually laid out the schedule and the expectations and everything, I was instantly freaked out because I was going to be working uh, 10 to 12 hour days. I was going to be averaging uh, between four and seven hours of driving a day all over Florida. Um, I was never going to see my family. I was only going to get Sundays off, uh, and like, uh, evening in the week, but that evening in the week didn't line up with the, the, uh, Sunday school, uh, meeting that we would have with the church. And so the schedule and everything was overwhelming. Uh, the job ended up turning into kind of a pipe dream. It, it was some people succeed at it, but you, I don't, I don't know how you could be successful at that and still be a family man. 
uh, the job didn't end up working out. We ended up, I ended up quitting it after a couple of months after really trying to make it work. It just didn't work out. And shortly after <clears throat> leaving that job, <clears throat> there was a, uh, not a tornado, a hurricane that was about to blow through. And we were not from the East Coast. We've never encountered a, a hurricane and I wasn't about to. So uh, Carly and I decided, hey, I, I'm not working this job anymore. Let's just pack up and go on vacation and just avoid this altogether. So we ended up <clears throat> packing up and coming up to Tennessee to visit. Uh, the reason we came to visit Tennessee is because it was only about a seven and a half hour drive. And I had come here 10 years ago and just loved it. And I've always dreamt of moving here. And I just wanted to show my family Tennessee. We ended up coming up to Tennessee, visiting, of course, feeling really strong that this was the next place we needed to go in our journey. To make a long story short, we ended up making the move up here. Um, but when I was preparing to make the move, everything happened really fast because we went to, to Tennessee on vacation, decided the day after getting home that we were going to move up here. And um, I had just a couple days notice to give my pastor. He went from thinking I was going to be there for years to I'm leaving and this is my last Sunday. Uh, we had nothing going for us in Florida besides this church. Nothing else was working out. I had been trying to find other jobs. Nothing was sticking. Nothing was working. Uh, the, the contractor requirements were way too strict. and It was going to be way too complicated to get my contractor license in Florida to start my own business. And so ultimately... Uh, it's what we had to do. But I remember reaching out to my pastor late one night and just saying, hey, this whole thing has kind of happened. We kind of have this experience. We feel like God is wanting us in Tennessee. Uh, we're leaving literally after church this Sunday. I'm so sorry. You've done so much for me. Please, you know, be understanding, you know, and I was so scared that he was going to to be disappointed and 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 do away with me just like so many people had done to me when I left the Mormon church. I'll never forget his response was just, you know, this, this hurts my heart to hear. I love you guys. I love having you here, but ultimately uh, I, I want you to be where God wants you to be. And if that's Tennessee, then I support you. Just make sure you come to church on Sunday because I have something for you. And uh, <clears throat> so we go to church that Sunday and we didn't really know what to expect. I gave him a big hug and uh, we cried, you know, before the meeting and, and we go in there and he ends up uh, standing up in front of the whole congregation and uh, leading the congregation in a prayer over us, uh, did this whole uh, devotion to us and, and how much he loved us. And, and uh, it was such a warm, uh, kind goodbye. Uh, and I just remember being so shocked at what it felt like to, to leave a church that didn't have the same restrictive, you know, uh, culture. It, it was really special. Yeah. That's amazing. I love, I love the contrast. It's my mom always explained this to me because my mom was raised in, you know, non-denominational Christian churches. And she was like, when you leave a church and you're a Christian, nobody like blinks an eye. They're not like, Oh, you're horrible. And you're going to hell. <laughs> Why is it like this in the Mormon church? You know? So, um, I appreciate you illustrating that for us. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about, um, what happened next once you got to Tennessee. Yeah. So, uh, kind of the way we got to Tennessee is we had friends here that had moved here a couple of years before, and they just happened to have a, a fifth wheel, uh, that they had it at a campground and they were renting it out. Um, and the guy who was supposed to be in that till the end of the year, just magically the weekend that we, uh, got back from Tennessee, uh, he had texted them and said that he was moving out early. And so they reached out and they're like, Hey, we know that you're trying to figure out how to move up here. We know that this isn't glamorous, but, <clears throat> uh, the, the guy who's running our fifth wheel just said that he's leaving and, you know, it'd be tight, but you guys could live there in the fifth wheel while, uh, you kind of get your lives back together and, and until you find a place up here. And so that was kind of our end. That's how we got here. Uh, when we first got here, <clears throat> I uh, immediately started getting licensed, uh, tried to get my company going again. I immediately took a, a job uh, with, with a family remodeling their house and things were going great at first, probably for the first month. We were feeling great, feeling like I was saving up money. We were going to be able to get into a place finally. But uh uh, after that remodel job got done, 
uh, things started to slow down again. And I was really having a hard time figuring out how to, to get more business in this rural area we are living in. Uh, I ended up trying to do that, trying to sell alarms again, trying to figure out how to make money. But again, our savings uh, were going down quickly. We are running out of money faster than we could think. Uh, and we are really starting to lose hope as to how we are going to be okay, how we are going to find a job and a place to live uh, with no proof of income. By this point, my credit started to get bad because I was just drowning in bills. A couple months in, moving from the RV into uh, this this uh, nightly rental house that they had, and they told us that we could be there through the end of March. Well, uh, during this point in time, as things continued to get worse, we continued to feel more hopeless. Things started to get really ugly for us. I felt like I had followed God to Florida. Now I'd follow God to Tennessee and he just wasn't there. Things weren't working. Things weren't happening. And I just continued to feel rejected by God and started to to really wonder if he was real. A couple months uh, into this, uh, this was uh, in uh, mid-February. It was actually on my wife's birthday. We get an unexpected text from our landlord saying that we had two weeks to be out of the house instead of six, like we originally thought our hearts sank. We didn't know what we were going to do. By this point, my business wasn't doing very good at all. I wasn't making much money. Uh, we had uh, a little bit of money in savings from some gift money that her that Carly's grandparents had given us, but no real proof of income or way to like to get into a rental. Now, the rental market out here is very hot, very competitive. Every bit as hot and competitive as Utah was, which shocked me. Um, and we were seeing people left and right that we knew with good credit, with a good paying job, proof of income, not able to get into a house. And we started to panic. Now we only have two weeks to move out. We have very little money. The little bit of money we do have is everything that we would need to, to put down our first month and deposit with the house. And we started to, to really panic. Well, at, this was the point where Carly, who had been super strong and super faithful this whole time, very confident that things would work out, started to lose hope. She started to lose hope. She started to give up. She started to, to get really scared. I was already past that point. I was numb by this point. What we ended up deciding to do was we were going to put a, a Airbnb on our last little bit of money we had on our last credit card. And we were going to get an Airbnb and give ourselves one more month to pull off some miracle and figure out how we were going to find a house. And we're thinking, how on earth are we going to move in two weeks, let alone in within six weeks, find a way to find a house and make all of this happen? We started reaching out to our church that we are going to and started to really try and and uh, work with them to see if they could help find us housing. Nothing was working. And the night before we were supposed to move, uh, we had already had most of the house packed. Uh, Carly and I are laying in bed and we both just started to cry. And I was just like, Carly, I'm sorry. I don't get it. Like we have followed God to this point. We've done all of this to try and make, to, to try and follow him and put him first. And this is like what we're getting. I'm like, is God even real? Like, let's be real. Do you really think God's even real? Because I don't believe he would punish us like this. I don't believe that he would curse us and do all these horrible things to us when we were following him and we were prayerful. What is going on? And she's like, I don't know, Dallin. I, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I, I'm very scared. I'm very hopeless. We had nowhere to go. Then all of a sudden, a scripture came to my head that my pastor had read in the the in church the Sunday before, and it was in uh, James chapter one, uh, scripture that we have read so many times, uh, that I had read so many times on my mission. But he pointed out a part of this verse that was different than I had ever heard before. I never paid attention to what happens in verses six and seven. And so I want to read this really quick. This is from the New King James Version. This is my favorite version to read now because it has all of the structural uh, parts of King James, but it's, it's smoother to read. Uh, <clears throat> but it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. 
For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. For he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. <clears throat> and in this very moment, I thought of this scripture and I thought about the sermon that we had on at church that Sunday. And I realized I'm a double-minded man. I've been putting my faith in God you know, kind of halfway following him, but being skeptical of him the entire time saying, God, I'm willing to follow you, but come on, like, are you going to deliver? Are you going to, you know, can I count on you? You know, and being very scared, very scared that he was going to punish me or that something wasn't going to work out. And I wasn't putting my faith in him. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden I had this recollection of all the different miracles that he had made happen in my life prior and how I knew those miracles would happen because I thought I was living righteously. So I thought that's why they would happen. Right. And, um, and God delivered and I nudged Carly and I said, Carly, wait a minute. Like we've been in a similar situation to this before. We just didn't realize it was this bad because we didn't let it get this far, but like God's made these miracles happen before. And for the first time in, in a year and a half, I chose to finally trust God with no doubt that he would make this happen, that he would deliver us. The very next morning I woke up and I had a feeling to check my phone for rentals. I end up scrolling a uh, Facebook marketplace and I end up seeing this house that I had seen a dozen times before, but it had been on the market 41 days and it didn't make sense because it was a brand new house in a cul-de-sac, uh, perfect, beautiful home. I didn't see how there, how God could, how, how that could possibly still be available in such a hot market. But I just had this feeling I should call on it. So I call on this op, this home and I talk to the landlord and the landlord's like, yeah, uh, it's actually been on for, for quite a while. And we've had 16 really good applications, but this is mine and my wife's very first rental. And we just haven't felt quite right about anybody yet that we have uh, talked to and have applied. We just haven't felt like we've found the right family yet to put in this house. And uh, he's like, but, you know, we, we kind of need someone in here by uh, this weekend because we're about to make our third mortgage payment and we just don't want to be upside down in this house. And I said, OK, I'll be there. So I met him there right away. We go and look through it. And at the very end, I tell him, like, look, I have bad credit. I have all of these things that have happened to me over these last two years. I have so many like so many reasons on paper for you to not trust me but i promise you sir if you will let my family uh if you'll give my family this opportunity i promise i won't let you down i promise i'll pay the rent like please please you know give us this chance and he tells me to go home and apply uh so i went back remember this was the day that we were moving out of that house go back we pack everything up we move i didn't get to the airbnb till like 1 a.m we fill out an application and uh, I just felt hopeless. I'm like, he's going to take one look at this and not want to even think about letting us rent this house. But the very next morning, he texted me and said, hey, um, we received your application. We've gone over everything. Yeah, I see what you mean when you say that your credit's a little dodgy. And he's like, but we just have a really good feeling about you guys and we want to offer you the house. And I just remember looking at Carly and just breaking down crying because we, we could not believe that God could be that good. We didn't have the money. We didn't qualify. On no grounds did we deserve, in, in the real world, did we deserve this house, uh, a house that's so perfect for us. It's in the perfect location. It's exactly the size that we needed. It taught me something about grace. We've been taught that, you know, that, yeah, G Christ saves us, but, you know, after all we can do and after, you know, after we've lived as righteous a lives as we can, then Christ's atonement makes up the difference. It taught me that, like, no, actually, Christ's grace supersedes any effort or action that we could possibly put into something. We could literally live perfect lives, never make a mistake or perfectly repent every time we do. And we would still be so far from the glory of God that it's not even funny. But Jesus reaches down in those darkest moments and just saves us. He just redeems us. He just does it automatically. And he does it because he loves us. He does it because he cares about us. Even though he let Peter panic, or sorry, Simon, as they choose in the chosen to call him, he let him fish all night, all night long. 
and not catch a single fish. But he showed up in the very moment that it mattered and redeemed him, completely saved him from everything that was against him, everything that was going to destroy him. He saved him and exalted him in an instant. And that's the Jesus that I now know. That's the Jesus that I now follow is a Jesus who, yes, he he wants me to do good works. He wants me to be a good person, but it's not so that I can earn his love. It's because I'm doing it because he has shown me his love. I'm, I'm living a righteous life because I'm so grateful that Jesus loved me enough to save me. Not because if I don't, then he can't because I didn't do enough. And it's a completely different way of living. And I'm just so humbled and, and honored to, to now uh, see things the way that I do. Yeah, it's so freeing when we learn those lessons about grace and who Jesus really is to us and how he really interacts with us. And it's beautiful. And your your story just illustrates that so wonderful and how he delivered you right in the moment that you needed to be delivered from all these things. So thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. So tell us a little bit about what your walk with Jesus looks like now in your life. And tell me a little bit about what the gospel looks like. How do you navigate that? What are your daily practices to um, get close to Jesus? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think that my favorite thing um, about the way I worship Jesus now versus the way I did is number one, it's not fear-based. And it's, there's not this, this formal structure to it. You know, the church has this formal structure, again, the way you're supposed to pray, uh, uh, you know, way you're supposed to do this and that way you're supposed to see God, all these things you're supposed to do. It's amazing to unplug from the expectations that have been set before me by men or by a church and be able to just seek a deep relationship with Jesus and follow whatever he, however crazy it is, follow whatever he prompts me or leads me to do. It's been amazing. And I, I say this a lot and people laugh um, and, and many might even consider this somewhat sacrilegious, but the, the best adjective that I can think of now to describe Jesus is that he's just rad. Like Jesus is like such an amazing, powerful person. And I've loved just seeking him in everything that I do. You know, uh, I've, I just barely actually today finished reading the uh, uh, the New Testament for the first time since leaving, completing it cover to cover. I had only read it one time before cover to cover, and that was before my mission. And with watching The Chosen and learning what these pastors are teaching, the version of Jesus and his gospel that I've been learning, and then seeing how supported all of that is scripturally, First off, I'm not seeing very many scriptures that talk about Jesus establishing a church and creating all of these ordinances and and giving the power of the priesthood by the laying on of hands. Yeah, it says that he gave them authority, but he did not give them a priesthood with all of these rules and guidelines and worthiness interviews. He didn't seem to be all that fond of the temple. You know, he went there to teach and he went there to, to chastise the Pharisees. He didn't. He didn't go there to worship every week or every day. He didn't encourage people to go there. You start to to read what Jesus was like and what Jesus really taught. And salvation is so much more simple than any religion would want you to believe it is. It's just become so powerful. Uh, I feel like my my prayers have become more genuine. Uh, Again, I feel like I'm motivated by by God's grace rather than a fear of the lack of God's grace. I just, I think that in a nutshell, uh, I have come to find great peace and clarity um, in discovering the power of Christianity without the distractions of religion. Yeah, I love that. All right. You just answered my last question, (laughs) Dale. How how do you find clarity now? Delve in a little deeper for us. How do you find clarity now in your life? I find clarity in knowing that God is our loving Heavenly Father, and He loves us so much more. And He's so much more understanding of us. And he, He can get so much more real with us than we ever thought. You know, like you were saying before, like sometimes you you're yelling in your prayers, like I think he really appreciates when we're honest, when we're authentic, when we really come to him. He meets us where we're at. He meets us where our heart is. 
Um, and coming to really understand that and coming to, to really realize how simple salvation is. It doesn't mean it's easy. It's actually not easy, uh, but it's simple. There's not this, you know, thousand steps to salvation program that every religion pitches. Instead, it is all about the heart, you know, and sorry to get on a soapbox again, but one last point I want to make is there were multiple times in the Bible where uh, either the disciples or the Pharisees approached Jesus and asked him, hey, so tell, tell us then if, if you don't, if you think you can heal people on the Sabbath and, and you were okay with letting that adulterous woman go and all these weird things that you believe, like what is the important, you know, uh, commandment? Like, what do you value? And Jesus every single time answered, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And it is that simple. If you love your God, you're going to serve your God and you're not going to be perfect, but he's going to save you anyways, because you love him, because you care, because that's where your heart is. That's where your focus is. And I've found so much clarity in weeding out all of the dogma and just 100% binging Jesus. Yes, I love that. Weeding out all of the dogma and 100% binging Jesus. <laughs> that's the best way to put it, Dallas. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dallin, for joining us for the Clarity Podcast. It has been such a pleasure hearing your story. Thank you for the opportunity. If you guys are interested in joining us for an episode of the Clarity Podcast, where you share your story of how you left mainstream religion to follow Jesus Christ, please feel free to reach out to me at clarity.podcast at gmail.com, or you can find me on my website at forgedinhisfire.com, or you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Forged in His Fire. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Clarity Podcast. Mm -hmm.